Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Radical Democracy Show. I'm your host, Kamali Rose. We've got a great interview for you today that we'll get to in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to remind everyone to please hit that like button right down there, subscribe to the channel, and share this video on social media to help us spread the word and grow this channel. If you can afford to do so, please support independent Black left media and democratic workplaces by supporting our show on Coffee or Patreon for as low as one dollar links to both of those are in the description box below huge thanks to all of our current coffee and patreon members who help make it possible for us to create content like this we literally cannot continue to exist without the grassroots support of folks like you so thank you and please everyone enjoy this great interview Joining us today is Professor Christian Chun, PhD. He's an Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics at University of Massachusetts, Boston. He's the author of two books, Power and Meaning Making in an EAP Classroom, published in 2015, and The Discourses of Capitalism, Everyday Economist and the Production of Common Sense, published in 2017. He's also the author of a recent article published on December 4th, in the Language, Culture, and Society Journal that caught my attention and is the reason why I wanted to have him on the show today. The article is titled, The Return of the Yellow Peril, The Fear of Getting Sick from the Other. Links to the article and his books and all of his work are in the description box below. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Professor Chun. Really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you for inviting me on. I appreciate it, Kamala. Awesome. So just to start out and get us oriented, uh, for anyone in our audience who might not be familiar with these terms, could you briefly define what uh, model minority and yellow peril are for us? So I'll start with the term the yellow peril because that was the term that came into social circulation in the United States uh, as well as Europe uh, starting in the 1800s with the colonizing and occupation of, of China um, by the UK, and how this discourse evolved to justify their colonial um, occupation and domination and carving up of the country. It also, there was a parallel uh, in, in, in the United States in which there have been Chinese immigrants to the United States starting from the early 1800s. And in fact, actually not just the United States, but the entire, across the entire continents of both North and South America uh, in the 1800s. Now, the, the inflow of Chinese labor of the immigrants, predominantly males in, in the 1800s started to increase with the gold rush in California in the 1840s. Uh, and, but then it really took off uh, in the 18, starting in the 1850s when the US government was building the transcontinental railroad and they needed, and this is an important point, they needed cheap labor. So the overwhelming majority of the laborers who were building the transcontinental railroad were immigrants primarily from starting from the East Coast, heading toward the center of the country, many of them were Irish immigrants. And then from the Pacific Coast, going the, up, the toward the, um, the middle of the country from the opposite direction, were Chinese uh, immigrant laborers. Now, interesting point was that um, at, while the, the Chinese laborers, as documented by several historians like Professor Gordon Chang at Stanford University in his book, The Ghosts of Gold Mountain, documented from the archived uh, records that the Chinese laborers were getting paid less than 50% of their fellow white immigrant laborers. So it was clear that the, you know, the powers that be, the, the manufacturers, the capitalists who were funding all this, they wanted the cheap labor to build that transcontinental railroad. Now, after the railroad was finished uh, in 1867, I believe that was the year, and then these manufacturers no longer needed the Chinese laborers, then that, that discourse of the yellow peril started coming into being saying, well, you know, well, now that you've finished, basically it's like, now that you've finished your job, go back home. You know, this, this ain't your country. What are you doing here? We don't need you anymore. And this wasn't just spoken discourse. This was embodied in violent acts starting in 1871 in downtown Los Angeles, a group of white, working class males descended upon the Chinatown neighborhood in Los Angeles and lynched uh, at least a dozen Chinese 
um, males uh, and uh, started burning down things. And those lynchings spread throughout the, the West Coast uh, into you know, places like um, Oregon and Washington State as well. And then there was the increased movement to ban Chinese immigration that's culminated in, well, starting with the 1883 Chinese Exclusion Act, in which this was the first uh, anti-immigration bill based on both race and class in the United States. And that bill, that law passed in 1882, um, 1882 uh, was in place uh, until the 1940s when it was rescinded by the US government because China was an ally of the United States during World War II in the war against Japan. But also importantly, because Japan, when they were colonizing uh, their uh, fellow East Asian countries like Korea and China, were pointing to the US saying, you know, well, you don't need the white uh, uh, people colonizing you, just have a, you know, be colonized by a fellow Asian. And, you know, the US likes to think of itself as a democracy, but look what they're doing to the Chinese, so we'll treat you better. So the, gov the US government in return realized this propaganda effectiveness and and decided to rescind the Chinese Exclusion Act because of Japan's um, framing of it, um, and so that was the that was the, those periods of the Yellow Peril. Now, with the model minority, um, actually, though the Yellow Peril came into being a little bit uh, a couple of years afterwards with the Chinese uh, Revolution of 1949. And then the US uh, government was kind of accusing uh, residents in Chinatown or, or surveilling Chinatowns in New York's, in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco for the alleged commie, and putting in its scare quotes, commie spies. And so that was also part of that. However, during the 1960s, there emerged a new discourse around Asian Americans, the model minority. Now, it uh, was uh, coined by the sociologist William Peterson in 1965, in which he was writing about the Japanese Americans and anointing them, in his words, the model minority. And as I wrote about in that article, just the previous uh, 23 um, years earlier, in 1942, the entire Japanese American population was incarcerated although not one had ever been accused of treason against their country. So all of these Japanese Americans were seen as the inside threat as part of the Yellow Peril, incarcerated in concentration camps, including, of course, the infamous Manzanar across the country. And then just a mere 23 years later, that sociologist Peterson is saying, oh, you know, we, you know, we should, you know, they're wonderful people, you know, we value them for their hard work and their culture of hard work as if no one else works hard. And as I pointed out in the article, um, was it just a sheer coincidence that the emergence of this discourse of the model minority happened during the civil rights era? You just mentioned at the end there that, you know, your this idea that the this took place right in the midst of the uh, civil rights uh, movement, this concept of a model minority seems to suggest that some minorities are not of the model minority. Uh, could you talk about that and how the model minority uh, myth impacts other minority groups? That's an important question. And in fact, in that same article that Peterson wrote, he, he also coined the term, quote unquote, the problem minority. He didn't specify who, but again, it was clear who he was referring to in terms of the civil rights uh, era. And so this was a, a classic case of how uh, capitalist culture continues to divide and rule amongst all working people uh, based on race and, of course, on gender. But here uh, in this conversation, the focus would be on race. And in terms of saying, well, you know, uh, there, there's a reason why some of these people have made it because, you know, they worked hard. And then, so why haven't you made it? Because you didn't obviously work hard. Well, you know, and I've had interesting conversations with people over the years. And, you know, one of the, the things that would come up, it was like, well, you know, uh, yes, my ancestors struggled, but they didn't come on board slave ships. They were not enslaved. Um, 
they were able to, in the, even from the very beginning, you know, kind of put together some money, maybe run some small businesses like Chinese restaurants, of course, or laundries, okay? But their ancestors weren't enslaved. You know, they, their property wasn't, you know, obfuscated. They were allowed in some ways to speak their own language. They never lost their heritage languages, um, unlike the Americans um, who who were enslaved from Africa. And so this, this model minority discourse has always been um, uh, poisonous in the sense of giving some kind of, you know, literally the, you know, tossing out the, the crumbs to some people who would be like, oh, okay, okay, we're going to be seen as Americans finally after all those decades of the yellow peril. Not all Asian Americans accepted that, of course. Many of them did reject it because they were in solidarity with other people of color and all, you know, people across the working class. Um, but it was a powerful appeal in which they were like, okay, you're going to be finally, you know, shorn of the yellow peril. You're going to be welcome into the ranks of whiteness, so to speak. Um, and you're going to be on our side because, you know, you've proven your worth, so to speak. And, and I think that has had a huge um, uh, toxic legacy in, in many respects, um, which, as we've seen, has turned upside down in the past 10 months with the advent of the pandemic and exposed for what it was and is. Who is determining what group is considered the model minority and why does it benefit them to do so? Okay, and that's an, another important question. You know, and it, it's interesting in terms of how uh, culture and economy has always been interwoven. And it really does rebut you know, this notion held by some who actually have not really read their works in any detail. But, you know, where Friedrich Engels, in a letter to um, Joseph Bloch in 1890, had pointed out in his letter that, that the whole point of him, his and his colleague and friend uh, Marx's work was focused on the reproductions of real life, and that they had never argued that the economy was the sole determining factor, okay? It is our obviously our social relations that continue to be constructed, co-constructed, deconstructed, that are embedded with how the economic relations are then enacted, okay? And so the question about who invented, the, why and how the model minority came about you know, again, it's not this idea of a conspiratorial, you know, agenda. However, it uh, it is a number of people that uh, Antonio Gramsci have de have designated the traditional intellectuals. That is, uh, academics, uh, journalists, uh, newspaper reporters, and so forth. Those who are, are are able to get their works published, to get their ideas. Uh, disseminated through the mass media now nowadays of course social media but back then it through the mass media and have these ideas presented to the public as fact as a kind of a well this this is what it is okay and so the the turn of the model minority again was in uh, of the part of the hegemonic uh, effort as it were uh, of continuing the classic divide and rule of like, okay, we're gonna have, we have this one group of Americans who are demanding you know, equal rights, you know, voting, the end of segregation, equal access to education and healthcare, you know, chances at jobs and so forth. And well, we're gonna have to, you know, uh, push back on that. And so, a convenient way again through as we've seen through history time and time again to choose one group now you know this is going back again back into the you know the 1800s where uh, as the historian W.E.B. Du Bois had written about in his book Black Reconstruction in America where he coined the term the psychological wages of whiteness and so for white laborers in the early 1800s who were getting paid a pittance right um, they they were often revolting, and in fact, the you know um, uh, Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, which was uh, in the late 1600s, was the was a great example of solidarity because first of all, this notion of blackness did not exist yet, 
amongst those laborers. So you'd have you'd have the enslaved people and, and the serfs from Africa, and then you had white immigrant workers, and they bonded together, all right, to protest on these plantation sites in Virginia. And guess what? The plantation owners were like, okay, this can't be happening. And so that's how race started to evolve as a construct, right? And so by 200 years later, they were throwing that pittance of the psychological wages of whiteness at poor white laborers saying, you know, yeah, you may be getting paid nothing, but at least you ain't, uh, you know what, right? And so that, that continued on into, of course, the 20th century when um, other emerging and growing um, uh, uh, people of color communities, uh, again, they were like, okay, we're going to have to continue the, you know, pick maybe one uh, group out to continue this divide and rule and Asian Americans were the convenient one to do so. So it sounds like um, essentially this is, you know, the model minority is being used uh, by the, you know, dominant ruling capitalist class to essentially drive a wedge be between uh, members of the working class. Um, is that a correct analysis of I it? I would say yeah, yes, in terms of dividing and rule amongst, um, you know, not not only the working class, but yes, obviously all people who are would be interested in working for uh, a more um, socially and economically just society. Okay. And would you say that the model minority myth uh, impacts all members of, say, the in-group equally, or is there a class element to it where it does disproportionately impact certain members of certain classes? Uh, the class. Uh, and so the that movie that came out two years ago, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, perpetuated the model minority myth in terms of, okay, you had this, you know, middle class Asian American woman, she falls in love with this her partner, who's originally from um, Singapore, and he comes from an extremely, up, you know, in, <laughs> ridiculously, insanely wealthy family, like they're billionaires, right? And the whole representations throughout was just like, oh, well, you know, you see, again, you know, these wealthy Asians. Uh, now, it was interesting because uh, about a year or so ago, the New York Times, um, uh, drawing on data from the Pew Research Center, showed that, in fact, uh, the Asian American community in the United States has now surpa surpassed all other communities of color in terms of the most disparities in economics. And so you have at the top tier um, some immigrants, recent immigrants uh, from certain countries who are highly educated, right, uh, coming into the United States to do a work in like uh, biotech, for example, right, um, IT and so forth. And yes, they're getting paid a good amount of money. However, then you have on the, the the opposite end of the scale, communities, you know, the Hmong refugees, for example, uh, um, immigrants from other Southeast Asian countries who are making much, much less than the median income in the US. So you have that huge economic disparities. Uh, and so even within the, obviously the Asian American community it has never been homogenous. It's always been quite diversified in terms of that. And so, yes, it is again, carving up within those particular, this under the rubric of, you know, the term rather of Asian Americans, you have all these economic disparities that are ignored in that discourse of the model minority. Um, and also been used to say, well, you know, that's your fault that you're not succeeding because you're supposed to be a model minority, right? Um, other, other people who look like you, I'm putting that in scare quotes, have made it. Why can't you? So, yes, that, that's also internal in terms of the divide and rule strategies. Uh -huh. Is there a benefit behind them essentially creating, I see this with, and this is something that I've talked about on the show um, uh, quite frequently. It's something that Cornell West has spoken on this idea of um, what he calls the HNIC phenomenon or the idea of a black monolith. Is there a benefit to, um, you know, sort of homogenizing a group in that way and, and create and sort of 
turning them into a monolith. Does that is is there some benefit to the capitalist class in doing so? Um, you know, you mentioned that you know Asian Americans, but Asian Americans would seemingly you know it, no, it certainly does refer to a very diverse group of of individuals. Um, so maybe you can you can talk about that a bit. There's always been that idea around identities in terms of, and this is one of the um, pitfalls of the neoliberalized identity politics. The assumptions, the assumptions are that if you are X, Y, and Z, then you're going to behave in this, in this way, because all of X, Y, and Z people are that way, right? And uh, there's also that assumption of like, okay, in terms of uh, political leanings or um, uh, political views, worldviews, uh, again, because you belong in XYZ group that you're all gonna be thinking the same. Um, that has never been the case, right? And again, it's, uh, I would think that it is part of this idea that if uh, in this neoliberalized uh, identity politics in which you, you anoint again a, a particular group in the under the uh, both the assumption and the per, uh, the per, uh, perpetuating the idea that all their uh, I, uh, beliefs are uh, universal within that particular group. Uh, it, it's going to uh, really attempt to again to maintain that. Uh, the power dynamics of, well, you know, this group thinks this way, so we don't need to bother with them. And you don't need to bother with them because that whole group thinks that way, so you have nothing in common with them because you're not part of that XYZ group. Um, so, uh, and again, I think that is part of, again, the, the how the, um, all of us who, depend on our wage labor to survive on a daily, monthly basis, that we continue to um, see each other through those lenses. Absolutely. Um, so you, you, you mentioned earlier the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, and I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Specifically, did did the Chinese Exclusion Act, was that, you know, you, you mentioned it, it, it was, as soon as you say it, it draws um, parallels to the modern, uh, you know, Donald Trump's um, uh, Muslim ban is, is something that, you know, it, it seems to be the sort of a precursor to uh, policy and legislation like that. Um, did, did the Chinese Exclusion Act, did that exclude all Chinese um, citizens from entering the U.S.? Or was that, was there some class dynamics at play behind the Chinese Exclusion Act? There, there was definitely a class dynamics uh, with that. So it, it was basically aimed at the working class uh, Chinese uh, male immigrants. Um, it was also in terms of um, uh, attempting to restrict all uh, uh, female immigrants. Um, so it, it was basically against the, the working class immigrants because uh, there were certain, um, as far as I understand it, certain uh, little bit of loopholes in which Chinese middle-class merchants, if they came with a certain uh, amount of money, uh, they were able to settle in the US. Uh, but again, it was you know, aimed at uh, the Chinese laborers who would be you know, quote, unquote, quote unquote, taking jobs away from Americans as we've seen this discourse played out again and again, right? Um, and it was interesting because it, again, in the contrast with the Chinese Exclusion Act, there was no similar uh, attempt to ban working class immigrants from um, nor, um, Northern Europe. Your article is titled The Return of the Yellow Peril, which suggests that this phenomenon existed, it went away, and has now returned. Could you, you know, tell us just sort of quickly sort of trace the the timeline of how that happened? I know you, you kind of went into it in the beginning and you gave us a pretty detailed history. Could you just sort of trace the timeline of that and also connect that to how yellow peril has manifested today?
uh, as we were talking about before, though the emergence of the model minority came into being in the 1960s, there was still always the undercurrent of the yellow peril. And, and again, as I relate in my article, you know, throughout my life, and um, you know, I've lived in in the United States. I've lived in uh, I've lived in uh, you know, I'm from New York. I'm from uh, Queens, New York City originally, um, and then uh, lived in Los Angeles for many years. But in, in both those two cities, which would be generally seen as being cosmopolitan, global cities, right? You would think like, well, okay, you know, people there are very you know, you know, worldly, so to speak. Uh, Numerous instances throughout my life when I was both in New York and Los Angeles where I heard people say things like, you know, hey, chink, or go back to China, you know, hey, Chinaman, um, things like where, for example, once when I was um, canvassing for uh, a peace group uh, in the late 1980s, uh, anti-war uh, group in the late 1980s in Los Angeles, and I was talking to a person uh, in, in their door in Santa Monica, and I was talking about how our tax money is funding, you know, the military buildup, and shouldn't that tax money be spent on, you know, building better schools and infrastructure and so forth? And the person said to me after I finished talking, she said, "I find it curious when uh, people criticize my country." And I looked at her and I said, um, "Yeah, it's my country too." Have a good night. And yeah. so that was always part of all these things that I'd gone through. This obviously has uh, uh, emerged out into the clear uh, with the advent of the pandemic, thanks to uh, that discourse used by him when he coined it as the Chinese virus, quote unquote, the Chinese virus and quote, Kung flu, and which has led to, as it's been documented, uh, um, has led to an increase of violent attacks upon uh, Asian Americans. Uh, and not just in the US, but it's also happened in other countries like I believe in the UK, Canada, and Australia as well. And so this, it, it, it was never, it, it was never you know, buried underground. It was always covert. It was always lurking there. But now this has been given the opportunity as it were to come back out in full force uh, and a, again, to kind of point out perhaps the obvious, um, gee, I wonder again if it's any sheer coincidence, it's be, uh, if it has anything to do with the emergence of the global economy of China as the main rival of the United States now. Uh, and so uh, if you would think like if this, um, the, vir uh, the virus originated in some so-called third world country, would had it have been framed in that same way? I doubt it. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Let me. So that's something that I want to delve into. I, um, you know, specifically this idea of um, uh, how it, you know, how this is being used by current administration, um, you know, Donald Trump's administration. Uh, he clearly has what is seemingly an ongoing, you know, Cold War, trade war, uh, at the very least with with China. Um, and it would appear that this rhetoric, um, you know, plays into that. Uh, you know, they, this, the, titling it the Chinese virus, this is something that we've seen throughout history. There was, you know, one of the most glaring examples that folks will probably be familiar with is many people may have heard the term the Spanish flu, um, but the so-called Spanish flu didn't actually originate in in Spain. Um, it originated in a at a military base in Kansas. Um, and so uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about that and why, you know, how, why, what the economic benefits to the the government are to create to use that kind of rhetoric um, of the Chinese the Chinese virus or the so called kung flu as as uh, Donald Trump put it. It's interesting. Man. I think it, it's very it's very complicated. I mean, uh, obviously, part of it is is um, based on xenophobia, uh, but it has also been this idea that. Um, Again, with the the perceived threat of the yellow peril in terms of 
again, going back to the 19th century of Chinese laborers stealing jobs, now it is um, uh, morphed into a much uh, more um, global scale of, well, the Chinese economy is, is, is stealing jobs, not just the individuals, but now that whole entire you know, country is stealing jobs. Um, of course, uh, ignoring the fact that uh, many American U.S. many U.S. corporations have shipped their jobs overseas, right? As we well know, right? And so, who's actually really, you know, at fault for causing the loss of jobs? Um, and it's and, and, and again, we we saw part of that with the during in the rise uh, during the 1970s with the rise of the the German and the Japanese economies after their recoveries from World War II, uh, and especially with the Japanese economy where uh, the Japanese economy was uh, seen not quite in the uh, blatant and explicit way that it is now with China, but it is definitely in in the late 70s and, and 80s, especially with the Reagan administration administrations where um, there were subtle references to the Japanese economy as being, again, a threat to the well-being of the United States, a threat to the American way of life. Oh, you know, we have all these Japanese products. What's happening with our products? How come our products aren't being sold? Um, as if we actually, as if um, everyday Americans actually had any investment in American products. It's like, okay, well, you're not making any money from the American products. And that has now, of course, uh, with the emergence of the Chinese economy in the last 20 years, now that has taken the place of that. So this is, again, always been an ongoing thing when any capitalist economy feels the threat of a rival capitalist economy around the world. And they, again, in terms of the cultural dynamics, they find ways in which to construct discourses to uh, anoint them as threats to the populace. Um, and of course, in terms of uh, refocusing the anger um, away from those in charge of the economy of that country to someone else's economy. One thing you mentioned there that might confuse some uh, right wing or centrist, uh, you know, folks that for whatever reason might might have come across this channel um, is that you call China a capitalist economy um, is, you know, could you maybe some some folks would would tell you that China is a, you know, they 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 they're communist, they're a socialist or a communist um, economy. How do you define capitalism and uh, and is it accurate to describe the Chinese uh, economy as a capitalist economy? Okay, thank you for that question, Kamali. It's, um, again, a really important question. So this is something that I actually uh, pose to my students um, uh, in many instances where I say to them, I was like, all right, so I'm in the classroom with my students and let's just say there's maybe, you know, 10, 15, 20 of the students. And I would say to them, this is what I say to them. I said, all right, let's just say uh, this classroom is actually a workplace. All of us are workers, right? All right, we're all showing up for work. Now, there's only one person, uh, could be me, could be one of you. There is one person making all the decisions on how much the rest of us get paid, how much time we get off, how uh, if we get any benefits, who, get, who decides to get promoted? Only one of us decides without any of us having any say. We could say something, but we have no real input on the decision. How would you describe that? Now, it's interesting when I've mentioned this to my students at least a couple of times, one student would always raise their hand and say, it sounds like a dictatorship, <laughs> bingo. Um, and so this idea around capitalism being uh, free <laughs> is that, again, so when you go to the workplace and there is one person making all the decisions, one person deciding on everything, that is not a democracy. And it's interesting when, you know, when the idea that Americans, we believe in democracy, okay, and this is, again, what I wrote about in a... Um, online um, magazine called Dig It Magazine. Uh, 
in terms of uh, how, how to talk to your conservative brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. But I would ask, you know, I would ask my fellow Americans, I was like, all right, um, do you believe in a democracy? And I would believe those people that you mentioned, that I would believe they would say, yes, of course, I believe in a democracy. I said, all right, great. I said, well, then what is there actually a democracy? Is it just going to the voting booth every two or four years for some politician who is getting funded, as we all know, or we should all know, uh, enormously by corporate benefactors. They're not getting funded by us. And so obviously they're going to be answering to whoever, whoever's paying their bills, right? Um, or is it something else that is actually a demo you know, democracy at the workplace? Now, again, it's interesting when I've had some pushback from some people saying, oh, well, you know, Christian, I mean, you know, that sounds great in, in theory, but it can never work in practice. I said, oh, really? And I said, um, then I point to uh, several uh, uh, places, uh, even here in Boston, where it's like, okay, actually, all these workers uh, are in charge. It's, it's a worker co-op, okay? That is what socialism is about. It is about democracy in action, democracy in the workplace. And so going by those definitions, China has never been a socialist country and neither had the Soviet Union because what the Bolsheviks ended up under Stalin and under Mao in China, they just replaced the capitalist class. So the Communist Party in China just replaced the capitalist class in deciding on who would get what. So essentially what we have there is instead of a private uh, uh, capitalism, you know, a private uh, corporate capitalism, it's a state run capitalism. Um, and I believe that's how economist Richard Wolff uh, defines the terms. Um, and he's literally written books on, you know, defining the different uh, segments of, uh, you know, sectors of uh, economics um, and different ideologies within economics. So um, on on that topic, um, you know, Richard Wolff, uh, who anyone who watches this show will be familiar with. We constantly reference him on the show. Uh, he's continued to uh, point out um, something that I saw you mention in your article as well, this idea of the strategy of using uh, yellow peril essentially as a a distraction, um, you know, and even the the model minority myth as well um, being used as distractions. But in particular, the yellow peril, this othering, the the you know, creating the boogeyman, this big bad other that's going to come and take all your jobs. And in in the past, it's been even you know, you know, take your women, rape your women, you know, the birth of birth of a nation, that sort of rhetoric. Um, so he, Richard Wolf, economist Richard Wolf has continually pointed out that the current anti-China rhetoric is essentially being used to distract um, from the failures of uh, not just the US government, but US imperialism and US capitalism. Um, essentially, you know, something I have to say, it's just easier to put the blame on some foreign other than to, you know, point to the actual issues at hand. Could you maybe talk about that? Um, do you agree with that notion that it, this is a distraction? Um, and maybe, you know, just expound upon that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I have drawn extensively on Professor Wolf's uh, work in my work. Uh, and yes, it, it, it does, it, 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 does, it is part of, uh, of the distractions. But I would also add on that it is not only uh, this idea of distractions, but it is also these attempts to perpetuate uh, whiteness. Uh, um, and in terms of when I say whiteness, it's not just white supremacy. It is this, like, the affects of whiteness. And so how and why do some, not all, of course, but how and why do some uh, people have, have continued to cling to the wages of whiteness and that term uh, coined by uh, David Roeder, who was drawing on the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, who I mentioned earlier. And so the, the clinging to the affects of whiteness is in this space of declining employment, right? Uh, a declining standard of living, you know, lower wages, pr the precarious uh, work situations that many find themselves in. And so this, um, these distractions are part and parcel of the continuing 
uh, the constructions, co-constructions of the affects of whiteness in which it's like, okay, again, we're going to just throw the, the crumbs of whiteness to you and you, that'll, that, that'll suffice. And in doing so, that is part of that where it's like, okay, you're white, at least you're not the yellow peril, you're not black, you're not Latino, you're not, you know, and so on and so forth. And so again, it, it comes down to how Race has always been a fundamental part of class, okay? Um, and that has always been the case. And in fact, again, uh, uh, citing the so-called moral reprobate German philosopher Karl Marx, he actually wrote about that. He said, the uh, labor can never emancipate itself uh, in the white skin as long as it's branded in the black skin. And so he already pointed out the racial divisions amongst uh, uh, white workers uh, in, in the context of the uh, uh, 1850s in the United States. How do you think, if at all, um, this rhetoric will change once Donald Trump is out of office and Biden uh, you know, enters into office or takes power. Do you think that this rhetoric will change? Uh, you know, and uh, in in what way do you think it might it might be affected? Well, the um, official rhetoric, as it were, from the incoming Biden administration will change. Um, I would I would think that they would uh, not use those terms. However, again, it's um, the fact that. Uh, those terms had such wide currency was not just because that one person invented it. It was, again, always latent. And so although the Biden administration will not use those terms, I think the larger question needs to be raised about how do we actually finally get rid of those toxic discourses? And uh, unless we actually address on multiple levels, of course, with the structural, social, economic uh, relations and cultures embedded in our society, to finally unearth those and you know and, and to uh, address the toxicity of that, because just because the incoming administration won't be using that particular discourse does not mean those discourses will ever go away, um, and we've seen that time and time again, where uh, it's with. Okay, um, Democratic administration might come in. Okay, there would be perhaps a, a fewer uh, violent acts, yes, and so forth. But again, uh, white supremacists and um, their acts of violence uh, is not a new thing, as we know. It's always been going on in this country. Um, and yes, some people enable it, some people legitimize it, um, but uh, it doesn't go away necessarily just because that person will be out of office. Thank you. Are there any specific programs or policies that you think um, could come out of a Biden administration or should be pushed for by the left um, in order to combat this in any way? Do you think that there are specific programs or policies that need to be put in place? Wow, that's a tough question. I mean, <laughs> I mean it would have to be on so many fronts you know, just drawing on my own disciplinary fields, you know, the, the first thing that would come to mind is in terms of education and in, in which, you know, teachers and uh, K through 12 teachers really need to uh, and should be allowed to be addressed to address these issues with their students. Because as we know, it, those are the formative periods of children when they're forming their beliefs um, that have been are being co-constructed with their family members, you know, their their neighbors and their communities and so forth. And it, it, these conversations really need to be had in those classrooms. Now, unfortunately, you know, with the whole you know, um, neoliberalization of uh, of education with standardized testing and all that, you know, this has been a huge pushback on that any kind of alternative curriculum. But uh, that, that re it does really start. I would. In one of the main areas, the domains would be the classroom in which these need to be addressed with students and have these students uh, talk about their beliefs. And uh, if these, if their beliefs are starting to become racist, um, need to be challenged with their by their teachers to show, you know, to kind of illuminate the their um, 
the fallacies in their views uh, and the logic behind that. So that's just one of the one of the many uh, fronts. Uh, you know, uh, I would say another front is that part of it is that again going to the the failures of the Obama administration, in which you know um, he had the chance and then for a number of reasons didn't capitalize on that chance to institute universal health care. And I think if we had a universal health care system, uh, perhaps not all, but perhaps a good percentage of the people. Um, who are angry about and accusing people of spreading the virus uh, wouldn't be less angry if they had actually access to universal health care and that um, uh, so many Americans wouldn't be dying because they had as good a care, as we know, as some people who had it and recovered because they had the best care, which most of us can't afford. Yeah, not all of us can do, you know, can get, uh, you know, helicopter, you know, flights to private hospitals um, where we have all the top doctors, uh, you know, taking care of us uh, on the taxpayer's dime, by the way, you know, so not all of us have access to that. Certainly. Um, what about uh, do you think the. Biden has been a supporter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and those free trade agreements. Um, do you think that that has any impact? And, you know, you know do, do you think that impacts people, you know, Asian Americans, uh, Asian immigrants uh, in, in, in any significant way? You know, does that play into this, this idea of yellow peril? Um, essentially, I, I, my thought is that out of these free trade agreements, they've set up a dynamic where it's essentially it just enables it's a freedom for corporations to sort of, you know, money is allowed to move freely, but not necessarily workers are not allowed the same free movement as the money um, in that situation. And so my under, you know, my belief and my analysis is that it has negatively impact impacted the working class um, you know, both Americans and, uh, you know, Asian Americans, because it allows corporations to exploit cheap labor. Do you think that, do you agree with that analysis or would you push back against that in any way? No, I, I absolutely agree with that. But, you know, it's, uh, the history of our humanities, you know, has always been where we're going, you know, this has always been going on for millennia, where all of us humans have traveled around this entire planet in search of a better life. You know, we go to certain areas, this is going on for thousands of years. And this is not just a recent thing in the past 200 years. We've always gone around the globe in search of a better life, whether it was better weather conditions, whether it was chasing after food and so forth, right? And so, you know, can you really blame, obviously, people who are going to be traveling around the world for a hope of a better life in terms of getting a job? And again, the powers that be are quite aware of this. And so they set those things up, as you pointed out, in terms of like, okay, we're going to easily have this, you know, global flows of money where those in power can decide where to set up their shops, where they set up their companies so they could pay the cheapest labor. And of course, you know, again, people whose communities have been devastated throughout the U.S. by the loss of jobs. I, I don't blame them for being angry. I would be totally angry too. But again, that anger has been displaced and for obvious reasons, and it's been uh, maneuvered to be displaced. And so, and but not, again, not all those people are have misplaced anger. Some of them are rightfully angry at those who cost them their jobs, the ones running the businesses, right? But unfortunately, others have misplaced their angers because in some ways it's easier to target people who look, quote unquote, different from them. And so if Biden continues, you know, the, again, the neoliberal identity politics of like, oh, well, you know, look at our administration, we're <laughs> really all diverse, and yet they're continuing the capitalist circulation of, of uh, flow in terms of cheap labor, um, it's going to come to the same thing. So again, you know, what we need to fight for really is local investments in terms of our communities, you know, using our tax money, the money that we obviously send to the government, that money should be invested in our local communities to create jobs in our local communities, support local communities and uh, worker run uh, businesses and so forth.
the powers that be, the capitalist class has managed to apply, um, you know, the this concept of yellow peril to the exact same groups that they've applied the concept of model minority to, which there's a seeming contradiction between that, um, you know, to demonize them on one hand, but then to, um, you know, uh, put them on a pedestal uh, on the other hand. Um, could you maybe just talk about how that's used and maybe the the precarious nature of the model minority. Um, it seems that it, it just as easily as it can be applied to someone or a group, it can be taken away. Um, and so how does that sort of play out? Um, and yes, and this is uh, kind of what I was referring to earlier. It, that's always been um, two sides of the same coin, right? And so uh, the powers that be again, who uh, are earn the power to anoint one as the yellow peril, and then uh, as the times shift, then turn it around to the model minority, and then as the times shift again, flip that back onto the other side of the coin to the yellow peril. Again, those two uh, anointments, discursive uh, um, anointments, have always been ex uh, uh, part, of, again, of that same strategy. Rather than you know, the idea around a society where these discourses would be rejected outright. And one of the key um, concepts that Marx uh, wrote about was uh, the English translated uh, translation was this word alienation. Um, but actually, he used two German words, uh, and they were uh, the original English uh, translations. They both used um, they used uh, alienation to refer to both. But what he was talking about were two interrelated concepts. One was alienation in terms of how we as workers we become alienated from the products that we make. Right. So, for example, we're you know we're we work in a car factory. You know, we we work the whole day. You know, uh, well nowadays, of course, with robots and you know automated uh, machinery. But you know, we, we make the cars. But then once we make the cars, it's not it's not ours. It was never ours. But we spend the whole day laboring it, and it's not ours. Unlike you know years ago, when when craftspeople would make their things, it was theirs to sell, right? When you know we make the cars, it's no longer. So that's what he meant by alienation. However, there was another important concept that was that's interrelated with that. That was also translated as alienated, but alienated. But the more correct uh, term would be estrangement. And so, connected with that, what Marx argued was because of these economic relations, the social relations stemming from the alienated economic relations, the social relations we become estranged from one another. And so, that term estrangement builds on that alienation, and where we are estranged from our fellow human beings. And I, what I see as those discourses of the yellow peril and the model minority are these attempts to estrange us from one another. Are there any lessons that we should learn from the application of yellow peril and model minority myth? What are the lessons, if any, that we should take from that? I would say, like in the interests of uh, you know building solidarity um, for all of us who have been um, the ninety nine percent of us who don't benefit from capitalism, I would say uh, in efforts to build the solidarities would be to have these conversations with people and ask them how and why they would uh, either use these terms, how and why they might identify with one term or the other. Uh, and what that means to them, what actual benefits are they getting from using that term? So if you have someone yelling at me, for example, you know, go back to China with your virus, okay, how is that actually benefiting that person? Is that person going to get a pay raise? Is that person going to be able to pay their rent next month? Are they, that person able to uh, avoid the eviction notice by yelling things at me, and obviously not just at me, but everyone else, right? That, uh, again, does not quote unquote, look like them. And so I think these conversations need to be had. Um, and this is something that actually I've been um, writing about in a, in a book that I'm editing on applied linguistics and politics, but how we actually can engage with people uh, instead of just kind of dismissing them as uh, so-called sheeple. But uh, it's important to have these conversations because um, uh, unless we actually have these conversations, we're not going anywhere.
Do you have any thoughts about how the marginalized working class can build solidarity um, when there's this sort of intentional division um, taking place amongst them? Well, you know, again, I think that has to emerge out of several uh, of important conversations and dialogues that need to be had to hear their thoughts and their feelings. Uh, but, you know, one of the things as I circling back to that, I, uh, what I was proposing earlier was to ask people about if they do believe in a democracy. Uh, and I think that it would be for me one of the starting points where um, I would assume or at least I would hope that most people would say yes, they believe in a democracy and then have the conversation about what a democracy actually is. Uh, is it about having equal rights just for some people? Is it for everyone? You know, what actually constitutes it. And I think that it would be an important starting point in that conversation. Um, you know, there are many other uh, avenues through which to kind of explore, you know, it, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't want to get into a, a religious debate or anything here, mm -hmm. but I mean, I just have to say that uh, for some people who um, uh, believe in the idea of uh, love thy neighbor, well, then maybe I would ask then, well, how would you define your neighbor? Is it again, only the people who are literally next door to you in your same street that again, quote unquote, look like you? I mean, or is it neighbors? Did he mean all of humanity? What do you think? I don't know. So, but again, it's just, uh, these are obviously very difficult conversations, but again, and, and that is one of the main reasons why they're not had. But I think, again, it's important that we start these conversations. Do you have any any last thoughts you want to share on this? Anything like that that stands out to you? Something that we didn't cover that you think is important to, to talk about? Um, anything like that? Um, no, I think I think I made all my major points. Um, you know, thanks to your questions, were were great. So, awesome. um, yeah, no, thank you again for inviting me. I really appreciate this, and it was nice meeting you virtually, Kamali. And perhaps one day in the future, when the pandemic ends, we'll be able to meet in person. I would very much like that. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. And I, again, I know you have a busy schedule, you know, editing, writing books, teaching. Um, and so I really do appreciate you taking the time to come on here and help us to better understand these very important concepts because we are uh, here on the show trying to do our best to build a united left and build solidarity across all groups. And so um, I think that conversations like this are really important to push that solidarity forward forward um, and to give a give people a space to sort of allow that to happen. Um, do you have anything at all that you'd like to plug or any causes that you'd like to advocate for or direct people's attention towards if they're interested in in building solidarity? Are there any organizations or movements that people should turn their attention to, um, to help combat yellow peril and model minority myth? I mean, I, I would just say one thing off the top of my head would be to uh, have people, you know, if, if they don't know much about it, to find out more about the Green New Deal. Uh, because, um, as you know, you know, uh, if <laughs> we only have a limited time uh, until um, it's irreversible, the catastrophe done to our planet. So. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And that is something that we certainly advocate for uh, here on this program as well. So and as well as Medicare for all a universal health program. How, do you have any thoughts on a universal basic income? Just one, uh, just wondering if you have any thoughts on that? Do you think that that would be beneficial? Is it um, I this is sort of a, a debate an ongoing debate on the left, um, as to the efficacy of a universal basic income, or maybe even a universal guaranteed income? Do you have any thoughts on that before we go? I mean, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on that on those policies much, but all I can say is that the, in my opinion, the universal uh, income would not be uh, a sufficient uh, substitute for again the whole restructuring of our economic and social relations, because you might have a universal income of what twelve thousand a year, what have you, but if if someone like Jeff Bezos is still making billions a year in income while the uh, warehouse workers at his company are making 750 an hour. What good is it? <laughs>
That's great. Um, and for that, do you do you believe that workplace democracy is a is an effective tool to help combat that? That's where it should start. It should start at the workplace. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, uh, Professor Chun. We really appreciated having you on today. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamali. Uh, Stay well and safe. Same to you.